Okay. Um, my name is Kelly Capuzzi. I'm a fisheries biologist with the state of Ohio, and I'm also an Ohio certified volunteer naturalist. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of programs for Arista at the um, at the uh, Pickley County Parks. Um, today we are going to be um, doing some electrofishing in Deer Creek at the Metzger Preserve. Mm -hmm. um, and I will let Amy introduce herself as well. Yeah, I'm Amy Mackey. I'm a watershed coordinator with the Ohio University Voinovich School. So I do a lot of um, a lot of work in Raccoon Creek, but other watersheds in primarily Southeast Ohio. We do sampling, project maintenance, grant writing, uh, things like that. The reason that we actually do this type of survey work is because we're looking at the health of the stream. So. The fish community, the, the fish and macroinvertebrates, the mussels, all of those things can tell us what the water quality is like. So we're trying to um, assess water quality when we do this type of work. We look at the biology. We also can look at the chemistry. We'll look at habitat. We look at all these different things. And it tells us the full picture of what's going on in the stream. Our streams used to be very grossly polluted back before the Clean Water Act. Um, we were, we, they were so polluted that we actually had a river catch on fire, mm. <laughs> Cuyahoga River, um, which is up in Cleveland. Uh, but all of our rivers in Ohio were, were doing pretty bad back then. Um, in the 50s, 60s, I mean, there was just no environmental regulations and um, you could discharge any kind of waste to the rivers that you wanted to. Um, but with the Clean Water Act passing in the 70s, we have seen a tremendous improvement in rivers around the whole state. Um, and now most of our large rivers are meeting, um, they're meeting the goals of the Clean Water Act, which is warm water habitat. A lot of them are actually meeting exceptional warm water habitat. So we're seeing exceptional fish communities. We're actually seeing our fish come back. So it's been really exciting to see that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons that we look at the fish community when we're doing these types of sampling. Electrofishing sounds like it could be harmful to fish. Actually, it's a very, it's a very great way to look at the whole fish community because we're going to find everything that's in the stream. Um, and it's a very gentle way, actually, of catching the fish. Um, it temporarily just stuns the fish. It actually makes their muscles contract and will make them swim right to the electrodes. So, and we'll, we'll go over a little safety talk, too. So we'll, Amy will go over how the electricity works. Um, but yeah, the, the fish will swim right to the positive electrode, which is our, our, the front of our net. And um, this is a much better way than how they used to do fish surveys. Sometimes they would use dynamite or they would use a, a product called rotenone. They still do that in some places on the Ohio River where they're looking at the fish in the channels and the, uh, the lock and dam, uh, what are those in the called? Pools. In the pools. Mm -hmm. um, so they will use rotenone, which basically sucks all the oxygen out of the water and it kills everything. And then they'll count the fish in there. So this way, this method is really good because the fish survive. They, mm. they, uh, most of them do not are not harmed at all. So you know we're able to catch them. We'll weigh them during a normal fish survey, uh, and then we'll release them back into the water. This is the method we're going to use today. This is a long line electrofishing unit. Uh, there are other methods of sampling. There's seine nets that are good for for like using in ripples. But with a seine, you can't get fish out from under rocks or out from under an undercut bank or under a big tree. Um, you can use rod and reel, like angling fishing. That's great for catching sport fish, the bigger fish, but you're not going to catch little tiny minnows and darters. No. There's trap nets, which a lot of no. the agencies use in big rivers and lakes. But those things don't work in stream situations like this, where you want to know all of the species that are present. So the elect electro fishing methods are really the best for these stream sampling environments. Um, there's a, a backpack electro fishing unit, the long line, and a boat. They all have very similar components. Today we'll use the long line. Long line's used anywhere where you can safely wade, wearing waders. Um, the backpack is for a lot smaller streams, doesn't produce as much electricity. And the boat is larger waters, lakes, uh, big rivers, where you cannot get in and walk and wade. So a few, quickly, a few parts of this system we're going to use today. We have a generator. This is not the same generator you would use to power like your refrigerator at home during a power outage. This is made specifically for electrofishing. Uh, this is a, a pulsed DC current. So this current is on and off, on and off, on and off really, really fast. So you can't just use this to plug in your refrigerator. And one thing to know is that average Joe off the street is not allowed to use this equipment. This is for research and education only. Um, it is a very effective method. If everybody was out doing this, people could over-collect species. So, 
couple components of this system. We have the generator that produces the electricity, and then we have the line. This is where it gets its name, the long line. Um, it is a, a waterproof line. It's hooked to the generator. At the end here is our, our net, which is the anode, the positive end. And what Kelly has in her hand is the cathode, which is the negative. Both of these have to be in the water in order for the electrical current to be produced. Um, like Kelly said, the way this works is this electricity causes the fish's muscles to contract really, really quickly. And then when that pulse lets go, those muscles uh, relax. <laughs> the muscles contract and relax really fast, and that forces them to swim right towards where the electricity is coming from, which is our net. When they get close enough to it, they actually pass out, float to the surface. Hopefully you guys will get to see some. We'll do around these root wads. There's got to be fish in these root wads right here. Um, so just watch for poison ivy, but you can walk around the, the edge here and, and see what we get. The fish will literally float right up to the surface or swim right to the net. And from there, we'll scoop them up and put them in our live well. This is a live well. It's, it has a bunch of holes drilled in it so that water is constantly circulating through the live well, helping to keep the fish alive. If you just put fish in a bucket, how do fish breathe? They breathe oxygen in the water through their gills. They utilize all the oxygen in a bucket of water really quickly. So the live well helps keep the fish alive and happy until we're done with our sampling reach and we can process the fish. Uh, so there's quite a few safety things that we have to make sure are in place before we use electrofishing equipment. You can see that Kelly and I both are wearing rubber gloves and waders. These are to protect us from the electrical current that's in the water. Rubber does not collect el conduct electricity. Um, one thing to remember, even though you're wearing gloves and waders, that doesn't make you invincible. If you go out there in the water and you go over your waders, you're going to get shocked. If a fish floats by and you reach down to grab it and you go over your gloves, you're going to get shocked. So you still have to watch the water level even though you're wearing waders and gloves. Watch out for each other if you're in deep water. Don't put your elbows down into the water. Another thing, uh, these net poles are made out of fiberglass. Fiberglass does not conduct electricity. We wouldn't want to use metal poles, even wood poles. As wood gets wet, that conducts electricity just like the electricity in the water that's stunning the fish. So we always use fiberglass net poles for our, our shocking net and our assist nets. Um, this net pole here has a safety switch on it. This switch right here is designed to protect everybody in the water, but primarily the person who is shocking. So you'll get to see this when we're in the water, but as I'm shocking, I will have this switch depressed. When this switch is down, the electricity can go out into the water. If this switch is up, that, that cuts the electricity off. So when I'm shocking through the water, if I trip and fall and let go of this net, that cuts the electricity, in theory. But these switches can fail. This is one of the most common things that fail in these systems. So we're always watching out, making sure these are still working. Also, remember I said you have to have the anode and cathode in the water. So another good way to sort of cut the electricity quickly is pick your net up out of the water. Um, but the only surefire way to cut all of the electricity is right here. This on-off switch on the generator here. So if the generator is not running, there's no electricity being produced, there's no electricity going into the water. So that is our biggest safety feature right there, is the power switch on the generator. We always make sure the whole crew knows where that switch is and how to quickly turn the generator off. It's always a good idea to have a safety person on the bank ready to turn that generator off if there is an issue. So that's a big one everybody needs to know. I think you guys even have another, another switch on your generator to stop the power. So we're looking for good habitat. Um, Anytime you have like these areas where there's nice like root wads, this is like the greatest place to look for fish a lot of times. That's where they'll be hanging out. And where the water is flowing really fast and then there's a slow backwater, that's where the fish are going to be. They don't like hanging out in the fast water. It's too much work to stay there. So they'll hang out just on the edge of it. Little rock bass. It's a blunt nose minnow. We have about 40 species, over 40 species of minnows in Ohio. Alright. 
good black bears in there now. Is that good or bad? It's not. It's. I mean, they're they're very. Um, they're everywhere. They're they're kind okay. of everywhere. They're omnivores, so they'll switch from eating, uh, you know, insects or algae or whatever. Um, you know, they're not. We don't want all of your species to be black bears, but it's, it's normal for some of them. Okay. Cool. So you don't want some, you know, omnivores are generally not a high quality indicator. Okay. You want more of your specialists. Okay. Like your insectivores. Right. Things right. that only eat insects. Those are really good to find. Um, with the uh, species with those? That would be a lot of the darter species. Okay. Darters. Okay. darters are all in the perch family. Right. Okay. So yeah. We, we would expect to find darters in the ripple areas if you can get over and into the ripple areas. So one thing that no these bedrock streams like this are really beautiful. They're very, very pretty, but there's not much place for fish to live in them. Uh, there's not actually a lot of in-stream habitat. So, so once we get to around these streams and stuff, hopefully we'll get some more. But with the really flat bedrock like this, right. there's actually not a lot of habitat. They like gravel and sand. No okay. problem.